Hello and welcome to CAUSE Live. We're coming to you from the Fall Enrichment Program. This year's theme is Marine Biodiversity. And here to speak to us about that is Luis Rocha of the California Academy of Sciences. Luis, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So you have kind of a long-standing connection with KAUST, actually. How many times have you been to campus? Yes, I've been here several times. I think this is my sixth time, so okay. keep coming back. Okay. And you've had the chance uh, already to get out and do some diving. How's that been? Yes, we've done a couple of dives in the last couple of days. Conditions could not have been better. The winds are very calm, so the seas are very calm, and the visibility is great, so the diving was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about, as part of your time here on campus, um, you're talking, you're, you're giving a, a keynote lecture at 12.30 today, um, talking about the twilight zone, right. which is the mesophotic uh, zone. Talk a bit about that, what that is, and why that's interesting to you. Right, right. So when we talk about coral reefs, everybody relates to, because everybody, almost everybody, has seen a, at least a picture of a coral reef, mm -hmm. and it's that clear water, sunlit area of shallow seas around the tropics where corals develop. Um, what um, a lot less people know is that corals are not limited to that top uh, 30 meters or so of water where we see the rich, very diverse coral reefs. Mm -hmm. They go deeper than that. They extend to about 150 meters depth. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'll talk about later today is the uh, twilight zone or mesophotic coral reefs, which are the deeper portion of the coral reefs, so the deeper two-thirds of the coral reefs. The shallow reefs are between zero and 50 meters. Mm -hmm. Between 50 and 150 are these mesophotic reefs, which are uh, a lot less studied than the, coral, the shallow coral reefs because they're uh, a lot more challenging to explore, to study. Yeah. You need technical diving or submarines or ROVs, and every time you need specialized gear and specialized training, it's a lot harder to study it. What, what has changed technologically that's allowed you to get into this specific? Right, right. So for me particularly, I study fish. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're studying corals or gorgonians or other animals that don't move a lot, you could potentially study that, those depths using a submarine. Mm -hmm. If you have the funding for it, it's using a submarine is very expensive. Uh, but because I study fish, I have to be there myself to catch the fish or to photograph it or to look at it. With a, studying fish with a submarine is very hard. Mm -hmm. They swim away very quickly. They're scared. Um, so I do it by diving, and uh, relatively recently, over the past 10 to 20 years or so, there has been a uh, 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 popularization in a diving technology that we call a rebreather, uh, which is a, a piece of diving gear that allows us to stay underwater up to seven to nine hours, which is what we need to do in order to decompress from those depths. So when we dive very deep, we have to come up very slowly um, in order to avoid a lot of complications. And uh, so we end up spending a lot of time in the water, and the rebreather allows us to do that in a very efficient way. You're, you're a curator currently um, right. at the Cal Academy of Sciences. So talk about your work. What, what is being a curator? Uh, what does that right, mean? Right, right. So I take care of a very large natural history collection that date back, dates back to the 1850s. Wow. So the California Academy is a very <laughs> old institution based in San Francisco. And uh, we have a fish collection, along with other collections, the fish collection is the one I take care of, mm -hmm. um, that is basically an accumulation of uh, specimens that we collected going all the way back to the 1850s. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of specimens that were used to originally describe species, and we have specimens that were collected in several locations throughout the world, mm -hmm. um, several from here, from the Red Sea, from my previous trips. Um, and they're all accessible online. So much like an online library, you can go into the um, uh, online database of our fish collection and you can see all the records for every fish we have. We have a lot of photos of those fish online too. And uh, if you're not happy with that, you can come visit us and everything is, is open and free and you can study the fish as you like. Right, so there's the academic side and then there's for the public side. How, how, right. does, that, how does that impact uh, things in, you know, particularly in conservation efforts? How does, letting the public in on some of this help. Right, out. right. It's an, interesting, it's an interesting conundrum that a few people don't understand, but most people do understand. But we do have also a public-facing museum with an aquarium where we keep a lot of live fish. And sometimes when we take people behind the scenes and we show them these, so my fish collection has about two and a half million fish in wow. jars. Mm -hmm. So when we show those fish, they ask often, well, what's the impact of that collection? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's minuscule. If you look at uh, that, the two and a half million fish being collected over almost 200 years mm -hmm. and from several different locations throughout the world, 
in a lot of them. So many of them that I brought from here, it's not fish that we collected dead from the wild. It's fish that we collected. Uh, we went to the fish market in Jeddah. I see. And we, we brought them back from there mm -hmm. uh, to the academy. So a lot of the times, it's not even fish that we actually catch. Mm -hmm. Um, you work um, to some degree with the IUCN. Um, right. It's the Species Survival Commission. Right. So talk a little bit about that and what that does in, in terms of work towards right. conservation. Right, right. So the IUCN is the institution that uh, uh, kind of makes the red list of endangered species. And that mm -hmm. red list uh, categorizes species into several different categories, going from least concern, which is something that is potentially not endangered, mm -hmm to critically endangered or extinct or extinct in the wild. Some species are extinct in the wild, but kept going in zoos and aquariums and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's several categories from uh, threatened to endangered to uh, critically endangered. And those categories, uh, they're designated usually in workshops. So you get, if you're working on, for example, the groupers of the world, mm -hmm. You get uh, uh, as many experts on grouper biology and grouper fisheries that you can together in a room for a week or so mm -hmm. discussing uh, how much those species have declined over the past few years. And depending on how, much, how big that decline was, then we put the species in the, in the threatened, um, endangered, or critically endangered categories. I see. In uh, what totality do fish move into more endangered as opposed to less endangered categorizations? Mm. That's an interesting question. Mm. Um, since we started keeping track of it, uh, sadly, I don't think there's any fish that moved the wow. other way from None. the endangered to the non-endangered category. Wow. There's a lot that stabilized, uh, and there's a lot that went from being not threatened or not endangered to being endangered, but I don't think there's any fish that went genuinely from a, a threatened, endangered category back into not, not endangered. Wow. In 2009, you were quoted as saying that uh, about 90 million groupers, it was thought, uh, were captured in that year. Right. 90 million is an astounding number. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that the, the designation grouper applies to more than one actual fish. Right. But uh, help us imagine what that means. Right, right. It's, it's a lot of fish by any measure. Um, in some places, consume them more than others, and uh, it's a different species depending on where you are. Um, the fisheries for grouper is usually a mixed fisheries, which is several different species. Uh, here in the Red Sea is one of the places where uh, groupers are fished a lot. Um, there are seasons where the fisheries is open and the fisheries is closed. Uh, the, the compliance to that is kind of in, in question right there in, in several different locations. Uh, but by any stretch of the imagination, it is um, um, a very high number, so much so that groupers um, are the family of fish in general that has more endangered species in, in the world right now, Yeah. Uh, mostly because of fisheries. So the other uh, families of fish that have a lot of endangered species are mostly freshwater fish, and the freshwater fish, by and large, are endangered by a different reason. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you imagine a river or a lake, it's something that it, it's in, in a geographical scale that's relatively easy for humans to completely mm -hmm. destroy. So it's, it's within the realm of imagination that a human activity can destroy a whole river. Uh, for the ocean, that usually doesn't happen. For, for the ocean, the, the, the reasons for decline are usually extraction, mm -hmm. fisheries, because we're not destroying the habitat at a wide scale yet. Mm -hmm. So most freshwater fish, they're endangered because of habitat destruction driven by human activities. Yeah. And most of the marine fish, especially most of the groupers, they are declining because of captures, because of extraction, because of fisheries. Are groupers on the red list? Many of them are. At mm -hmm. least a, a third of all groupers are um, in one of the threatened categories. There's about 70 to 90 species, depending on which taxonomer you talk to. Mm -hmm. About a third of those are in the, uh, in the threatened category. And that 2009 number that you mentioned mm -hmm. came from a workshop that uh, we conducted in 2006. So it took us about three years to get all of the data together and publish the paper. Um, but the IUCN, uh, we reevaluate all of the species every 10 years to mm -hmm. see which direction the trend is going, if the, the species are getting better or mm -hmm. worse. And we just did, we just had another workshop about two years ago, 2016, in the Azores, which we, where we reevaluated all of the groupers and we saw exactly that. We saw that there was no change from 
endangered back into non-endangered. There was a few species that went from non-endangered into endangered, and there was a lot of species that remained endangered. Even though we published that paper that at the time had a lot of uh, uh, press attention and a lot of people didn't know about that. They, they started knowing about it, but not much has been done because the, the trends have not been reversed. Yeah, and do you chalk that up to human uh, exposure or? Yes, for the groupers, uh, the main threat, um, I think for every single species of grouper that is endangered and declining today, the main threat, the only threat is, is fisheries, is extraction for fishing. I see. They're quite easy to catch. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very voracious predators, so you put a hook with a bait in the water, one of the first things you catch is a grouper, if they are around. I see. Um, then let's zoom out a little bit. Um, what is the big picture impact, at least on fisheries or, or fish populations as you see it, of, of human populations? Right. Uh, how are they affecting populations of fish? Right, right. So up until... 10, 15, 20 years ago, the main threat to fish populations in the tropics, which is the area where I specialize, especially in coral reefs, mm -hmm. was uh, fishing, overfishing. And uh, when you fish, when you remove something like a grouper from an ecosystem, that causes effects into all of the, in the entire community of the, uh, of the, the coral reef. Because a grouper would be eating a parrotfish that would be eating algae. So when you remove the grouper, there's a lot more parrotfish and then people also fish parrotfish in some places. So depending on where you change the, the food chain in a, term, in a certain ecosystem, it changes the whole ecosystem a lot. And groupers, because they're top predators or mid-level predators, when you remove them, you change the entire community uh, of, the, of the ecosystem, of coral reefs in this case. Yeah. So it has a deep effect on the, on, the eco, on the entire ecosystem when you remove something like groupers. Now, the main threat to coral reefs in general up to 15, 20 years ago used to be fisheries. Now, fisheries continues as a threat, but uh, the, the warming trend that we're seeing in the waters that is causing corals to bleach is now the, the top threat by a long shot because it's destroying the ecosystem. So it's affecting not only groupers, but every other fish in, the, in the coral reef. I see. So it has that feedback loop yeah. into the fish system. Yeah. Yeah, it's the structure. So the corals, they basically build the ecosystem. So if you think of a uh, 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 coral reef as a city, I don't know, the groupers would be something like the, the lawyers that keep the society going. Mm -hmm. But the, the corals would be the buildings. Mm -hmm. So if you kill all of the lawyers in, in, in a certain country, <laughs> the society will, will have an immense, immense effect in the society, but the society potentially could keep going, make more lawyers, or, or I don't know, change people from being an engineer to being a lawyer, or something like that. But uh -huh. when you don't have buildings, uh -huh then you don't have the, the basic infrastructure. That's what corals are to coral reefs. They're the basic building blocks of the, of the, the ecosystem. If you had, and maybe, maybe you do, um, if you had recommendations for how we stabilize these fish populations and, and, and sort of help protect the reefs, right. what, what are some of those things? Right. I think um, worldwide, uh, better fisheries regulations would go along a long way in helping fish populations. Mm -hmm. um, creating more marine protected areas in, in coastal zones, in places that are uh, under immediate threat. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a trend that I don't particularly agree with uh, that has been increasing lately about protecting areas that are really far from human uh, impacts, and those are politically relatively easier to protect, but they're not under immediate threat. So while it's important to protect those areas, I think it's much more important to protect the areas that are under immediate threat, mm -hmm. uh, where species are under immediate pressure, um, and those, I think, should be protected, should be prioritized in, in protection schemes. I see. Um, I notice on Twitter, quite often, you use the hashtag hope for reefs. Right. So tell us why you have hope for reefs. Right, right. Um, so yeah, when we talk about coral reefs, invariably we get uh, into the um, uh, negative thinking that the whole ecosystem is going to crumble in 20 or 30 years. Sure. I particularly don't see that happening, mostly because of what we see in places like the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf and um, um, other areas throughout the world. There's mm -hmm. some refugia, if you will, where, where corals are not uh, um, dying as fast as they are in other places. Mm -hmm. 
And in those places, there's more resilient corals. I think eventually they're going to reseed and, and help the entire ecosystem recover. So I think corals are more, in general, they're more resilient than what people give them credit for, mm -hmm. and they have the potential to bounce back. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I have hope for, for them. Now, having said that, I think we still need to uh, um, protect them in, in every way we can, mm -hmm. globally and locally. Um, I know there are a number of examples in the national park scheme where um, animals higher up in the food chain are reintroduced and that helps fix a bunch of problems further down the scale. Right. Is there any model for this in, in fisheries that you've seen? Um, not successful. I see. <laughs> Um, there's quite a few places where people tried these reintroduction schemes and they haven't been done with a lot of thought. So in many cases, when you reintroduce a species, uh, it ends up causing more problems than, than solving them. But if, you, if it's done in the proper way, it has the potential to definitely to help. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, a lot of people, they also try to do that without removing the impact. And that doesn't help either. So if you say, you, I mean, imagine a situation where we fished all of the groupers out of the Red Sea, uh -huh. and you want to reintroduce the groupers. You you only successfully reintroduce groupers into that population if you had better fisheries regulation. I see. So a lot of times people try to mitigate the problem without removing the impact, and it doesn't work because you didn't remove the impact. So we have, regardless of the, what the remediation is, we have to remove the impact. It's the same for coral restoration. There's a lot of talk about restoring coral reefs today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a good thing to do because it's probably going to help them in the long term, but it's, it's, uh, it's not the end solution if we don't remove the highest threats that are affecting coral reefs today. I see. Um, we're going to check with our audience here. Does anybody have a question for Professor Rocha? Yeah, please, go ahead. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> uh, thank you. I just wondering regarding uh, uh, the blame on uh, fisheries or overfishing or harsh fishing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get convinced that human impact is highly negative, right? And we neglect the area of climate change responsible for huge amount of effect on fish biodiversity. Right. We feel it in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. We are around the big group of community in the world mm -hmm. and we are trying to at least increase the awareness of people regulate your fishing right at the same time we need to take responsibility about crime right do you agree with that yes absolutely yeah yeah i think um fisheries regulation is is essential better fisheries regulation not only regulation there's a lot of places where there is good regulation but not good monitoring and uh, you have laws on paper that are not followed on practice, and that doesn't work either. So it has to have, it has to be hand-to-hand -hand regulation, uh, monitoring, and education too. Because if you don't, if you don't tell the fishermen that why they can't go out fishing, they'll continue going out fishing because they have to feed their families. Um, so uh, it's a, it's a very tricky situation that goes from high-level economics all the way down to social, like on the ground kind of work. It's a very complex problem. Are there models, f again, for this that you've seen uh, that you feel positively about? Yes, yes. <clears throat> there are several islands in the Pacific, for example, that are very successful in doing that, mostly by decentralizing regulation. So when they regulate, in general, I think, when they regulate things at the, the, the village or um, small region level, they tend to work better than when you regulate at the national level. And I think it's because of the disconnect between who's making the regulation and who's having to follow them. So I think the bigger distance there is, if, you can, if the fishermen can go out and talk to the manager that did the regulation, I think they work a lot better than when you have someone in the capital making all of the rules and someone all the way a thousand kilometers away in the coastline having to follow them. I see, I see. Any other questions? So uh, we already know the, uh, the damage humans have caused to the environment, but aside from that, are there any other, you know, uh, any other like impacts that is caused by factors not being done by humans? I mean, uh, 
like disasters or something that has been done indirectly by humans like global warming right. or stuff like that. Right, right. Yeah, so for coral reefs right now, global warming is the biggest threat um, in, in many areas because it's causing corals to bleach. And uh, when the corals die, then the whole ecosystem dies with them. Um, in some areas, they're more resilient than in others. So here in the Red Sea is an area where corals are a little bit more resilient against uh, uh, bleaching than in other areas. So if you've seen in the news the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, almost 70% of it bleached over the past two years because of high temperature or high water temperature. Um, in the Red Sea, the proportion of corals that bleach is a lot lower, mostly because the corals here that are used to high temperatures and summers here doesn't get much more hotter than this. Um, but there is a lot of bleaching going on here too. Um, now, what's, what the difference between the, what happens now and what used to happen 100 years ago when human uh, uh, influence was lower was that these bleaching events are a lot more frequent. Uh, so the, the, the bleaching is not only affecting a bigger proportion of the corals out there, it's also repeatedly happening much more frequently. So that they're happening now every year. 20 years ago, there was a bleaching event once every five to 10 years. Now it's almost every year that they're happening. So the, the corals are getting destroyed a lot faster than what they used to be. Yeah. 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 I have a question that might sound uh, a bit naive. So um, species invasion, is this something that seas could suffer from? I mean, something that would affect endogenous uh, species? Yes, in the sea. absolutely. There's several cases. So the question was about species invasion. There's several cases of, of um, uh, species invasion that are negatively affecting ecosystems worldwide. One case is, is relatively close to here, uh, the Swiss Canal, the canal that was open connecting the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. It's incredibly good for human economy because it saves, I don't know how many metric tons of fuel every year. So instead of having to have a ship go all the way around Africa, you can cut a little 100 kilometer canal, but that canal opened a connection between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. And there's a lot of Red Sea species that are now invading the Mediterranean and having effects in the Mediterranean ecosystem. So the same way that when you remove a grouper from an ecosystem, you have a negative effect. Sometimes when you add a grouper to an ecosystem, you also have a negative effect. So there's a lot of fish from the Red Sea in invading the Mediterranean um, and spreading throughout the Mediterranean, having a negative effect that, there. Now, having said that, in some cases, it can also be a positive effect, especially in the Mediterranean, because the Mediterranean is uh, one of the most heavily fished, or is the most heavily fished sea in the, in the planet. Um, historically, people started fishing there two, 3,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So they already removed a lot of the species. So a lot of people are saying that adding a few more species wouldn't be completely bad, mm -hmm. which remains to be seen. Um, there are some species that are invading and having a negative effect, but there are others that are relatively neutral, so they're not having a difference. But yes, um, absolutely, uh, species invasion, human mediating species invasion is, is having a deep effect in ecosystems worldwide. D does, uh, this, does this happen evenly in the upper parts of a coral reef as, as it does in the twilight zone? As you we don't know. Ah, we don't know. I have no idea because every time we go to the twilight zone, we find new species. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the most basic thing you can do in biology is describing a species. Mm -hmm. So after you do that, then you do everything else. Um, every time we go to the twilight zone, we don't even know what's there. About a third to half in some locations, half of the species we find in those deeper areas in coral reefs are entirely new to science. So we don't, we don't even know what species are there. So when we see a species, that is a new record that used to be found elsewhere. We don't, because there's no prior studies done, we don't know if it's a recent colonization or if it's something that's always been there. So it's probably gonna be very hard to answer those questions the deeper you go in the ocean because we don't have a lot of baseline knowledge for the deeper areas in the ocean. And, and our, is there a lot of fishing activity at that depth? Yes, there is. so okay. um, um, uh, the, the twilight zone, the mesophotic uh, coral reefs, everybody kind of thought or assumed that they were outside of human reach mm. because they're deeper. So divers don't get there, so human impacts don't get there. Mm. But one of the things that we noticed with our exploration, our ongoing exploration, is that there, yes, there is a lot of impacts there. We see 
broken fishing lines and pieces of fishing gear all the time. So people are fishing deeper and deeper, especially when uh, in areas where those uh, deeper reefs are closer to shore. So in some areas, you have to go out a long ways on a boat to get to a deep reef. In those areas, the deeper portions of the reef, they are kind of relatively safe, not because they're deep, but because they're very far from shore. But in places where the deep reef are very close to, to shore, like in islands or, or here, mm -hmm. we do see a lot of impacts, human impacts, even on the deeper reefs. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, we have one over here. Maybe we can pass the mic. Thank you. Uh, what is it? Hi. Uh, I'm a biochemist uh, background. I don't have uh, a, a good uh, knowledge about the marine um, okay. uh, biology. Mm -hmm. But what do you think uh, about the algae? Do you think an, uh, they have an impact on the uh, hmm. coral? Yes. Beach? Yeah. So. Um, yes. So there is algae. Um, it's interesting. That the algae and the corals are always competing on the reef for space. Mm -hmm. And up until a few years ago, corals used to always win the fight between the corals and the algae. Um, but now humans, in places close to cities, we're adding a lot of nutrients into the water, like into, in, in the forms of pollution. And when we do that, the algae outcompete the coral, so they overgrow the coral. Um, so uh, in many places, algae are becoming a problem because when they overgrow the coral, then we don't have the building block of the ecosystem anymore, so everything, the diversity in general decreases, and the corals, the, the, reef, the coral reefs themselves, they become dominated by algae. Um, in other places, algae are kept in check by herbivores, by fishes that eat algae or other animals that eat algae. In those places, when you remove the herbivores, the parrotfishes, for example, are a good example. In many places, people like eating parrotfish and they fish for them, they trap them, they spearfish. And when you remove the parrotfish, the algae, they start growing faster and outcompeting the coral. Um, the, uh, the, the coral bleaching itself, it's, it's interesting because it uh, it's, uh, results from a, the breakdown of a symbiotic relationship, a mutualistic relationship between coral and algae. So there's these algae that outcompete the coral, but there's also algae that live within the coral tissue. They're, they're called zooxanthellae. It's a microscopic algae that lives only within the tissue of the coral. And uh, it, it's a fascinating recycling system within the tissue of the coral. So the algae, they use the light from the sun and uh, the, the waste from the coral. So when the coral feed, they produce waste, and then they give that to the algae, and then they combine the nutrients they get from the corals and the light, and they photosynthesize, and then they give sugars back to the coral, and the coral use that as food. So it's a nice recycling system, but when the temperature goes up, that relationship breaks down. And that's also why it's called bleaching. Mm -hmm. So what gives color to the coral is the algae. So when the relationship between the coral and the algae breaks down, they, the coral expels the algae, and then they turn white. Mm -hmm. um, so if the temperature goes back to normal within a few days, then the coral can reabsorb the algae and continue living normally. The microalgae. The microalgae, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. The other yeah. algae are a different type of algae that can definitely outcompete and, and will, kind of take over the entire The macro one is competing. Macro one is competing. The micro one that lives inside the okay. tissue is the one that helps. That's nice. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Do, do we have other questions? There's the yeah. Uh huh. species, right? So, the, and, and before that, you were speaking about the Persian Gulf, and there are like the the species, and not only that they are, uh, they're not really disappearing; they stay in a man, uh, in a maintained base. So, have you tried to do a DNA sequence between the new species that you always found, and between the early the the species that the that, that disappeared, mm. and to see that they were just an evolving mutants of the previous ones? Right. Um, most of the case, that's, that's not the case. Uh, most of the time, that's not the case. We do do a lot of DNA work. Uh, traditionally, the way you describe species has been just morphology. So in the okay. case of a fish, my specialty is fish. Mm 
so back 20 or 30 years ago when DNA sequencing was not uh, popular, not everybody could do it, um, what we did to determine that something was a new species was look at, uh, for a fish, for example, you'd count the number of spines they have on the dorsal fin and the number of rays and the anal fin and the number of uh, the, the, the proportions of measurements on the fish and you'd compare that very detailed morphology between the species and then decide if they're new species or not. Oh, okay. um, now today we go around that, but we still have to do all of that, but we kind of go around it by sequencing the DNA and then determining how far, how divergent they are in the DNA. And most of the time, um, I would say all of the time, the divergence is, is very long, long, long ago, like half a million or a million years ago. It's a very long time divergence. So they're so far apart from the others that there's no question. It's, it's a, not only a new species, but it's a very old new species that we're finding. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Any questions? Any further questions? Well, very good. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, Luis, Thank you. Uh, for joining us and, and have a, a great you know, remainder to your trip. Um, you're you're going to be talking at 1230 yes. here in the auditorium. So uh, best of luck with that. Thank you. And that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. as we speak with Greg Skomel of the Massachusetts Marine Fisheries Shark Research Program. Remember to comment, like, and share on all the KAUST social channels. And from everyone here at KAUST, Thanks so much for watching.